with you guys, unless my dad lets me talk again, but I don't know. He's so excited that he may not. Um, so this week, uh, we're going to talk, oh, Michelle, I don't know how to do that, the whole Bible thing. Uh, I was about to say, I don't, I skipped this part because I don't know this after all these years. You would think I would know this memorized, but I don't. All right, raise your Bibles. We'll say it together because it's on the board. So this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Michelle. I literally skip it every week because I don't know it. You would think I would. I've gone here a long time. So, All right. <laughs> Don't tell him. Uh, <laughs> I know other things. It's okay. <laughs> I don't have to know everything. All right, so this week's sermon's titled, uh, Waiting is Not a Passive Activity. So when we think about waiting, we think about it means doing nothing. I mean, that's how we think about waiting. Um, think about the last time you had to wait for something. And in my world, it's like waiting in the drive-thru. I hate waiting in the drive-thru. I really hate waiting in the grocery store line. Those are like pet peeves of mine that honestly God's worked on me about. You wouldn't think I would have to, but he has. You knew it was a problem when my two-year-old or three-year-old was like, why is this taking so long in the middle of the grocery store one day? So I thought I should probably work on that. So waiting. What did you do during the time of waiting? How did you feel? Uh, what was your attitude like? Did you consider it joy? Probably not. I rarely considered waiting joyful. Um, the reality is we want everything now. We are an instantaneous nation. We want our food to be cooked now. We want things to happen now. We want projects to be done now. We don't want to wait. We don't like it. Um, we don't see the value in it most of the time. We think, if I could just get this done right now, things would be so much better. That's, that's what we tell ourselves, and certainly that's how we act. But sometimes, God has specifically told us to wait, and sometimes he's just been silent, so we're forced to wait. Um, the reality is, though, that season of waiting, when we actually physically are required to wait on God, it actually is for a purpose. And even though we don't see the purpose typically during the wait, rarely do we see the purpose during the wait, it's usually like after the fact, we look back and go, okay, I understood. But during the time of waiting, we don't always understand the purpose, and we certainly want it to move faster than it is. But the reality is God did not call us to wait passively. Unfortunately, me being an accountant, when I think of passive activity, I automatically assume what the IRS defines it as. And the IRS's rules of a passive activity is a, it's a venture that you do not actively take part in. You are on the sidelines. You don't make decisions. You don't participate. You just kind of exist. It's something that you do that you don't really have any say in it. Um, it's just part of something, part of your life or a hobby or a business, something. But it's very passive. You, you just kind of are, you're just kind of a part of it. Um, so when I think about that as a passive activity and, and the fact that God has not called us to wait passively. He hasn't called us to wait and do nothing. He wants us to actually have a purpose. So even though what you may have asked for hasn't happened yet, it doesn't mean it won't happen. Amen. And it doesn't mean um, it's going to happen exactly like you planned for it to happen. Um, but the reality is God has purpose in what he's asked you to do, in the purpose, in the wait. So we're going to talk a little bit in um, Habakkuk today. We're actually going to read quite a few verses in this scripture. So if you guys will turn to Habakkuk 1. Habakkuk. Huh? Habakkuk. Is that how you say it? I couldn't tell you. It looks like Habakkuk. <laughs> well, I'm going to say Habakkuk, so <laughs> I'm sorry if that offends anybody. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lisa. She's like, you're saying it wrong. Oh, 
course I am. If my husband was here, he would also be telling me I was saying it wrong. He likes to correct me like that. Um, so we're going to talk, we're going to actually talk quite a bit about this prophet. And uh, this, what did you say it was? Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Okay, I'm going to try to say that right. Habakkuk. All right, so this prophet, um, there, his book, I assume it's a he. I just made that assumption. I don't know if there was female prophets. I'm sure there were. So I assume this was a he. I honestly don't know that answer, but not important for our discussion today. Habakkuk. Habakkuk. <laughs> I'm not going to get this right. <laughs> I'm not going to get it right. Let's move on. <laughs> All right. So this whole, this, this book is only three chapters long, but those three chapters are super powerful. They have so much in them. And as I was digging into this book, I kept thinking, gosh, there's so much here. How do I just focus on one thing? But I focused on the weight because that's really what I was thinking about when I was thinking about, even though there's a ton here, um, the prophet was asking about why is this all going on? Why is this happening? Um, he's talking about violence and um, not seeing things the way that he expected to see them. Um, but there was a time of waiting in these scriptures. So starting in verse 2, chapter 1, it says, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice, and why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous so that the justice is perverted. So when I was thinking about these scriptures, the first thing I thought about was the way how honest this prophet was with God. Like how often are we that honest with God? Like he was really frustrated by this. He's like, how long must I call for help, but you don't listen to me? And the reality is God moves the moment we ask. He's doing something. The problem is when we don't see it, we make some assumptions that God's not doing anything. We assume that because things aren't happening in our timeline that God's not moving. But the reality is God and Daniel, when Daniel prayed, they said as soon as you prayed your prayer, God went to work. And, and I believe that that is true for us today. It's not just in Old Testament history. It's it's for us to say God immediately starts working. He immediately starts going to do something. We don't always understand what that something is. And honestly, there's probably times when God doesn't want to tell us because we wouldn't understand. And even in these scriptures, it kind of even alludes to that. Um, sometimes God's doing something that we don't think would be the right answer, right? Like he's working and, and moving, but we're like, well, God, but I really wanted this. I really wanted you to do it this way. You know, we make assumptions about how God should do something, thinking somehow that we are smarter than him, when we all know that that is just not the case. Um, but I'm not even going to say his name. The prophet, he was honest with God about his feelings. He didn't, he wasn't scared to talk to God. And, and honestly, he was just like up front in God's face about it. He was frustrated by everything he saw, and he was passionate about what he saw. And he was expecting God to answer him. He prayed expecting an answer. Jump to verse 5. 5 through 7 says this. God answered. He said, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I think that's amazing. He's like, I'm getting ready to do something. I'm going to actually tell you what I'm going to do. And you still probably aren't going to believe me. I am raising up the Babylonians, which were more evil than the people that were already um, destroying the land that he was living in. The Babylonians were uh, ruthless people. He said that were ruthless people and who swept across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreaded. They are a lot of themselves and they promote their own honor. So God was taking people that were not looked upon kindly to solve the problem that he was praying about. And, and I love that first vibe. He said, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. The reality is so many times we're praying about something and God's like, even if I tell you how I'm going to solve this problem, you're probably not going to believe it because it's so outside what we would think 
is the appropriate way to solve the problem. It's so outside what we want God to do that sometimes we even think, God, that's just not possible. But God works in a way that we just can't even understand. And even when he does things that we think, I'm just not really sure how this is going to work, um, we kind of sit back in May sometimes. And I feel like that's just like the amazing thing about God. He does things so outside our human nature so where we can't even believe that anything anybody else could have done it except God, right? Like he's the only one capable of actually doing that. Why in the world would God use a people who were more evil than the people already there to solve the problem? Why would he do that? I feel like the only way, the only reason he would even do that is just to prove that he was working. And he says, I'm raising them up. And those scriptures, I think, he's like, I'm working. I'm doing something. Yeah, you don't know what I'm doing yet, and I, but I'm actually going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm raising up these people. That means there's going to be some time in there, right? Because he's working on the people that he's going to raise up to solve the problem. He's preparing them to solve the problem. And, and so there's going to be a season of waiting in there, right? Because he can't solve the problem today because the people aren't ready, right? So if he were to do it today, it wouldn't have the effect that it would in the time that it's the right time because the people aren't ready yet. So he needs a time. There has to be a time of waiting. So even though the prayer went out, it's not going to happen today because there's stuff that has to be done between today and them solving that problem. There's going to be a time to wait. Don't worry, though. The prophet goes back and complains some more. He goes back to God. He says in verse 12, he says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those mourning righteous than themselves, more righteous than themselves? So he says, why do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent? while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves. He was frustrated. Why is this happening? Why aren't you moving faster? Why are you letting the righteous suffer? You know, it's, it's like he, he had all this stuff going on in his world, and he just was so frustrated because God wasn't moving faster. But I love what he says in verse 2. He says, I will stand at my watch, or chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I will stand at my watch, and station myself on the ramparts, and I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So he, he questioned God, and God answered, and he questioned again, and he answered again. He says, I'm going to stand here and wait. I am going to watch, and I am going to station myself, and I'm going to look, and then I'm going to expect God to answer, right? He did it say, well, God, you're not moving in my time frame, so therefore you must not be moving, so I'm just going to give up, Right? He said, no, I'm going to, I believe with everything in me that this is going to change, that you're going to answer my prayer, that you've heard my prayer, and I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to wait, and I'm going to watch, and I'm going to look for you, and I'm going to expect you to do something because I'm active in my waiting, right? I'm not going to just wait for something to happen and assume that you've got all this and, and just sit on the couch and read a book. Like, I'm going to be active. I'm going to make myself a part of the waiting. I'm going to trust in you, and I'm going to look to you. I mean, there's so many action words in that scripture. And then I'm going to expect you to answer. I'm like, that's pretty bold. <laughs> but, you know, I think God's okay with that. I think God's okay with us being bold. He said, I'm going to expect you to answer. What are you going to say to me? And I'm like, okay, all right, take it. <laughs> right? But he said, the Lord did answer in chapter 2, or verse 2. It says, the Lord replied, write down this revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up and his desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. The rest of chapter 2 talks about the destruction that he's going to have on the people that have hurt his city, right? He, the, God talks and tells them and says, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to save your people. Um, and even though he cried out for injustice, this verse in there, in the middle of it, he said, but the righteous people 
will live by his faithfulness. And I think God gave him that scripture so that in the midst of his waiting, he would have hope. He would have something to hold on to. So when we're waiting, when the waiting is really hard, I feel like God will give us something to hold on to. He will give us the scripture. He will give us a word from somebody. He will give us um, encouragement from somebody else where we can stand on and believe that moment. And even though in this moment, this prophet was really struggling and was really upset and he was broken for his country, God told him that the faithful, the righteous will live because of their faithfulness. He gave him something to stand on to, to hold on to when everything else was falling apart around him, when he was so frustrated by the injustice and so upset by everything that was going on, God gave him, this something, gave him something to hold on to. He gave him a word. You know, he gave him somebody, something to hold on to. He didn't just say, well, yeah, I'm going to do it. But after everything that this conversation had gone through, God says, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. So he gives him something, right? And that's what the word of God is for us. It's that something that we need. Sometimes God will just bring a scripture to your mind when you're waiting and you're frustrated and you're sad or you're broken or the waiting feels like too much and it just feels so heavy. And I, that song that we sang today about, you know, I choose to praise, right? I choose to praise during my wait. And I will keep waiting and I will keep waiting and I will keep waiting because God's good, right? So... In everything that we do, we have to make a choice. It's an active time of waiting. It is not a passive activity. It is not a time where you're just supposed to hope God's going to do something. You know, it's not like you're sitting back and going, okay, God, well, I don't know how this is going to happen, but whatever. You know, it's not a lazy waiting. It's active. It, you have to take a part of it. You have to be a part of your season of waiting, and you have to understand it has purpose. When we don't understand the purpose of our waiting, we want it to hurry up and get over with so we can get to the next thing. But that's not the way God has it. He doesn't want us to, to get over the waiting because he has purpose in it. He's going to do something during it. We have to trust that, God, that God's plan is bigger than our plan and that the waiting is for a purpose. And that waiting is going to be better than if we had just done it ourselves. So he gives him hope. Um, in chapter 3, it ends with this. This is the very end of chapter 3, and it's quite a few scriptures, but I'm going to read them all. It starts in, in verse 13. Basically, the prophet goes back to God again, and he's telling him more about, are you going to do this? Are you going to do this? But the very end, he says this. He says, you came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness, and you stripped him from head to foot. And with his own spear, you pierced his head with, when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crops fail and the fields produce no fruit, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God and my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. And I just love those last four scriptures. He talks about how God delivered him, right? God conquered the injustice that was going on. He came in and delivered exactly what he was going to do. And, and the prophet's sitting there going, you did all that, and yet the land is desolate. There's nothing left. Though the fig tree does not bud, there's no grapes on the vines, there's no olive crops, there's no cattle, there's no sheep. Even though things look awful, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in God my Savior, and the sovereign Lord is my strength. Yet things looked awful. From the natural, the prophet's looking at it going, I don't even know how we're going to survive this. There's nothing left. Yet I rejoice in the Lord. So when things don't look good and things look like it's taking way longer than it should, and when from the human standpoint we look at our situation, we're like there's just no way it can get better, the prophet tells us, yet you have to rejoice in the Lord. During the times of waiting, 
when things look so, sometimes things look worse before they get better, right? And so many times we're looking at our situations and we're looking at, God, how in the world are you going to do this? And God says earlier in the scripture, I'm going to do something that you're not even going to believe, that you don't even think is possible, yet I'm going to move and do something great. And even though it looks bare, it looks impossible, it looks like your waiting was for nothing, it looks scary, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Regardless of what's going on, we have an opportunity to choose to rejoice in the Lord, regardless of what our situation looks like, and regardless of how long it takes for God to move. Waiting is not easy. And when things don't look like what we expected them to, it gets even harder. When we expect God to move in a certain way and he doesn't, it's super tough. It is really hard to trust in God when he's not moving the way we've asked him to. And typically we have very specifically, very specific prayers. God, I want this. God, I need this. My family needs this. And we give God our prayers. And we typically are very specific, like I need you to do this. And sometimes God's plan is different than that. And it's not that he hasn't heard you, but he has a better plan than what you've asked for. So, so in your times of waiting, you should stand. You should not be weak. You should be an active part of your waiting. You should expect God to do something. He is not there. He's not being silent because he's not working. I feel like sometimes he's silent because we need him to be silent. Because we need to work on ourselves. We need to do something ourselves. We need to do, figure out what it is that God wants us to do. And we have to be so focused on our relationship with God that we're willing to do what it is that he has planned, right? Sometimes in our waiting, God uses that time to help us understand that what we're thinking about or what we want isn't really his plan. And, and maybe there's a better option, but maybe we're not open to that yet until we have to wait for an answer. So in your season of waiting, be active. Even when it looks like God's not working, he is. So rejoice in the Lord. Be joyful and be of good courage. In Psalms 27, 13, and 14, it tells us to be of good courage and God will strengthen us while we wait. So there's sometimes during our waiting, God needs to improve us. He needs to get us stronger. You know, if he were to give us what we want when we want it, it would not be good for us. You know, sometimes my kids want things, and I'm like, no, you can't have that. And they're like, well, why not? I'm like, because it's not good for you. Well, you get to do this. Well, I'm an adult. I can handle it. You know, I'm not going to let my 10-year-old drive my car. That would be silly. You know, he's not old enough to handle that responsibility yet sometimes. Sometimes we're not prepared yet for the responsibility that we've asked for. And God needs that time of waiting to help prepare us, to grow us stronger, to help us learn. And if we're truly open to God's plan, we will seek him in such a way that says, God, do whatever you have to do in me during this time of waiting. If I need to grow stronger, show me what those things are. If I need to forgive someone, show me that person that I need to forgive. If I need to do this, show me what it is I need to do because I'm okay with whatever it is that you've called me to do and I'm okay with the waiting just show me what it is that you want me to do. Just reveal to my heart today what I need to do because this is my heart's passion. In Psalms it says that God will give you the desires of your heart, right? And sometimes our desires of our heart are, sometimes they're material. Sometimes, and I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting nice things. Um, I prayed for a house for five years. I lived in a tiny townhouse with two children um, for five years, well, actually, Mason only lived there two months, but uh, me, Austin, and Chris lived there. I lived there for nine years. In about year four, if you've lived in a townhouse, you know they're not the easiest places to live, and lots of people in the community, and you share walls with people, and it was very loud sometimes, and people in your driveway, and I was like, God, I've got to get out of this house. I need a house. Like, I need a house to raise a family in. My son needs to be able to play in the backyard without... Anyway, so I was like, I prayed for it. I prayed, and then one day I was driving past this neighborhood, and I was like, God, that's the neighborhood I want to live in. And I was just very clear. I was like, that's, I want to live in that neighborhood. It's in the school district I want. Looks like it's a nice family-friendly neighborhood. It's got lots of kids out there, lots of bikes and stuff. And I was like, my kids need to grow up in this neighborhood. It's where I want to live. For five years, I drove by that neighborhood, and I prayed that God would give me a house in that neighborhood. 
and I didn't understand why it was taking so long, and we tried to do it ourselves. We went and looked at other houses. We would go to houses in that neighborhood. I'm like, oh, God, I can't afford these. These are too expensive, and I would just, I, we'd go look at other houses in other neighborhoods, and my husband's like, we got to buy this, and I'm like, I just don't have peace about it. It's not our house, and he's like, but I really want to move. I'm like, I know. I do too, but we got we to gotta wait. We have to wait until it's the right time. The year that we built our house, uh, it was in 20, 2008, which most people would be like, you built in 2008 when there was a recession. Yes, I did, because you know why? Housing prices were lower. The builders didn't have any houses to build. So we got our land for half the price that it should have cost us. I, my husband had just been laid off. Another crazy, you, you built when your husband was laid off? Yes, I did, because he got a severance package, which gave us the down payment we needed to put down on our house. There were so many things that in that year God orchestrated, and even though I didn't understand why I had to wait five years, by the time our house was ready to be built, I was excited that God allowed, gave me the strength to wait five years. If we had moved earlier, we would have paid way too much. My husband got laid off in the middle of that. That would have been scary. Um, there was a lot of things that I didn't know that God was doing or had any clue what could be happening in the world that allowed us to get the house that we wanted for the price that we could afford. Um, it was just so many things God put in place. And if I had tried to do it on my own, I would have messed it up because that's what we do. I don't think God has a problem with that. Maybe yours is more like a personal relationship. Maybe there's someone in your life that um, isn't saved and you've been praying for their salvation. Maybe it's a relationship. You've been praying for a relationship. Um, in all times, we assume we know what's best. But the reality is that in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God is very clear that our thoughts are not as good as his thoughts. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so frequently, we get so focused on what we want, and, and we get so frustrated by the weight that we miss God, that we miss what God's plan is, that we miss what he's trying to do. Those scriptures to me are so humbling to think that somehow I know better than God does. To somehow think that I understand his purpose better than he understands his purpose. Natalie Grant sings a song called King of the World. And, and one of the lines in the song says, when did I forget that you were the king of the world? And so many times we, we try to put God in our box and say, God, move the way I've asked you to move. And, and so many so often that creates so much frustration because when he doesn't do what we want him to do, then it creates anger or frustration or separation from him. We, we think, well, I can do this better on my own. And then we draw away from God instead of drawing to God. But yet he has a plan and a purpose. And those, that plan is just so much better than our plan. And, and sometimes it takes long suffering. We have to wait and we have to wait and we have to wait. But the reality is God's capable, and we know he's capable, and that is why the wait is so hard sometimes, because we know he can do it. It just doesn't always mean he's going to do it in our timing, and it doesn't mean he's going to do it in the way that we've asked him to. He's going to do it in his way, because I guarantee you, whatever you've thought about, his way is better. Even though he's maybe promised you something, you know, he promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a, a baby, and they waited a long time, right? Many, many, many years. He promised Abraham he would be the father of all the nations. Well, you can't be the father of the nations if you don't have your own people, right? So God gave him that. It just took a really long time. And in the midst of it, Abraham and Sarah tried to do their own thing. They tried to fix it. They tried to help God along. That wasn't a good choice. Um, and that's what we try to do so frequently is we try to help God with his plan and with his timing. And in the, in the scriptures in, in verse, uh, Habakkuk verse, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, in the Message Bible, it reads this way, if it seems slow in coming, wait. It's on its way and it will come right on time. So many times we think because there's a wait that God somehow isn't going to do what's right and that if it's not in our timing, then it must not be the right timing. But God says it will be right on time. So you have to trust the process. You have to trust 
that God's plan is better. You have to trust God. You have to be an active part of your waiting season. And there's so many times, and sometimes maybe not we're not waiting for anything, but there will be a time that you will wait for something, that you have asked God to move. Maybe it's about a job or prom promotion or there's something in your life that you're like, God, I need something better. I need a better opportunity. And if you had taken the first opportunity, maybe that wasn't the right one. And sometimes we get heartbroken when we get passed over for promotions or, um, you know, a different job maybe that you've interviewed for. And you think, if I could just get that job, God, everything would be better. And then you don't get it. And you're like, I don't understand what just happened there. There may be a better plan. You know, trust the process. Trust the plan that God has. Trust the waiting season. And don't be passive. Make it an active part of your conversation. Don't pull away from God when you don't get what you want, but draw closer to him. Lean in closer. Stand stronger. Continually look and be in expectation. God will move. He just may not move the way you've asked him to. But trust the process. Trust that the waiting season is for a purpose and that whatever it is today that you're waiting for, don't feel isolated. Don't feel lonely. Don't feel like God's forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. He is with you. He is working. Sometimes I just pray for a word or a scripture to help me stand on because sometimes it is hard through those times to think, you know, God, I, I just don't know what to do right now. I don't, know what to, I don't know what to say. I don't know how I should act. I don't know where I should go. And so we struggle a little bit with that. And I think it's okay to be honest with God. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling like you've forgotten me. I'm feeling sad. I mean, God will, God's a, he's a big boy. He can handle those emotions. What he doesn't like is when you just to draw back and to not, and to stop talking to him and to think that he isn't moving because he is moving. He's doing something in your life, in your actions, in your day to day. Don't see waiting as a bad thing, but recognize it for its purpose. Recognize that God's doing something through it and that he may be helping you grow. Um, I had one other scripture I was going to tell you guys about. In Psalms 25, 4 through 5, David asked God to show me your ways, teach me your paths, and lead me into your truth, and teach me, for you are the God of salvation. On you I wait all the day. And I thought, if all of us could take that scripture, and when we're waiting, seek God and say, God, show me your ways, and teach me your paths, and lead me in your truth. Because waiting can sometimes be a really long time. It could be years. We think of time as a big deal. God does not think of time as a big deal. I know, it's really just us. You know, if he takes a day, we're like, oh my God, it was a day. I, I kind of laugh a little bit. My son was playing a video game yesterday, and I was sitting in his playroom with him, talking to him. And he's like, oh, my gosh, this takes forever, in, like, normal kid voice. And um, I said, what's wrong, Betty? He goes, did you know it takes 30 seconds for this thing to reset? <laughs> oh, my gosh, 30 seconds. And I try not to make fun. <laughs> like, I was just like, man, Betty, that's really tough, you know, because it's, re it's really real to him. And I was like, and he goes, and then once you do this, it takes another 30 seconds, and then you've got to wait a minute. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, please give him patience, because at some point, that 30 seconds ain't going to feel like a big deal. You know, it could be years. <laughs> so I just, I kind of laughed, but I didn't laugh out loud, because that would have really upset him. Um, but our perspective in our weight is very personal. And it's very individual. So for my child, who had to wait 30 seconds, that was a huge deal and made a huge deal about it. Um, and sometimes people are waiting years for God to answer their prayers. Um, but in those moments, in the wait, seek God. Seek God and ask him to show you what it is. My prayer lately has been, God, don't allow something to happen to me that I'm not ready for yet. Please create the wait. Because if I'm not ready, I don't want to jump into that. I don't want you to answer the prayer. I've, asked, I've had a very specific prayer that I've asked for for at least five years. And um, now that I feel like it's actually going to happen someday, I'm like, God, please don't, please don't move too quick. <laughs> right? Like, I know this is what I want, but if this isn't your plan, please don't give it to me. 
because my heart is so much about what God wants for me and so not about what I want for me. I want to be the person in all areas of my life that God has called me to be. And if that, what I've been asking for, isn't his plan, I'm asking him not to do it. It's the desire of my heart, but I'm like, God, if this isn't you, I pray that you would change my heart. If this isn't your plan, I pray that you would open another door. I pray that you would close this one and open another one because my heart is focused on whatever it is that you have called me to do because my heart is about you. It is not about me. It is not about, uh, you know, my job or, you know, I love my family and I want the best for them and I pray for them constantly. But use me in whatever way you feel like you should use me. And if that doesn't align with what I've created for me, then change my heart. Help me see that there's a better way. Show me, teach me, show me your truths, lead me in all righteousness. In everything that you do, God will, God will fulfill your, the promises that he's made for you. If he's made you a promise, you can stand on it. You have every right to think about it, to, to, uh, to claim it. If he's made you a promise in your life, you better believe he will deliver on it because God is not one that he will lie. So whatever you're waiting for today, I pray that you wait with a joyful heart, that you wait in expectation that God is going to move, but he's going to move in the way that he sees best, not always the way that you see best. So be open to that um, and be willing to do the things that God's called you to do. So as we end this service, I thought there was, oh, I was like, I thought there was a musician somewhere. Thank you, Silas. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to stand. We're going to pray. I would.